Good morning, everyone. It's a blessing to be able to gather together with you to study with you a portion of God's Word. If you would, this morning, open up your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2, please. Colossians chapter 2 should be a hopefully familiar set of passages to you this morning, but we'll be spending most of our time looking at Colossians chapter 2, beginning there in verse 6, down through the end of the chapter, where Paul gives warnings to the church at Colossae and to those brethren there, beginning in verse 6. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding with thanksgiving. Kind of what we read a little bit about before the Lord's Supper this morning, that we walk in Christ, that we serve him, has been a lot of the theme of the book of Colossians. It's been a lot of the theme, especially when you get into chapter 3, about some things that we need to do as Christians. But chapter 2 primarily pertains to those warnings to those who are established in the faith. That while he will give instructions, in especially chapter 3, of some ways that they're supposed to live, of some things that they're supposed to do as Christians, some attitudes that they should have. Chapter 2 is him warning about the pitfalls that while you have been spared, you have been forgiven, a lot of chapter 1. You have learned to Christ, you have obeyed him, you have been baptized. That doesn't mean that we can't fall back. That we cannot stop walking with Christ and instead turn aside, first and foremost, as verse 8 continues to the philosophies and the traditions of man. Colossians 2, beginning in verse 8, reads this way. Beware, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For you are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. The problem that Paul brings up here is one that is as old as men really have been. A lot of men's answers and ideas are very often flawed and dangerous. As we looked at a little bit this morning in the adult Bible class, if it does not come from God, if God has not spoken it, if God has not asked of it, then why should we do it? Why should we pursue those things? Why should we call something that God has not called holy, holy? Why should we think that we have better ideas than God? And you can see this in every aspect of our life. When it comes to worship, when we start proposing ideas and when we start coming up with ideas that are for worship, that does not fall into what God has said, it leads to empty worship. It leads to worship that has no use. In vain do they worship me. It's empty. It's useless, Jesus said. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. There's a lot of traditions in worship that promise everything, but in reality, they destroy what is most valuable. They lead our soul into temptation. We are not walking in Christ. We are walking in what man has come up with. And there's a lot of religions and there's a lot of groups that really use this to prey upon people while offering no spiritual surety, while offering no promise, while having nothing that God's word promises us to those that walk in faith. You can see this in Catholicism. When there's a lot of folks that go and they worship and they are part of the Catholic Church, and one of the ways in which the Catholic Church has preyed upon people for a very long time is there is no promise of heaven. You can get someone into heaven if you pay us a little bit more money. If you give us a little bit more. If you give us a little bit more. And there's that idea of purgatory that a lot of people, well, they're in purgatory now and you got to pay this much more so that you can get them into heaven. And there's the old story that has been told by a number of preachers that I don't know where it originated that, well, they're paying money, they're paying money, now his foot is in heaven, but you got to pay a little bit more to get the rest of them in heaven. Well, now his arm is in heaven, you got to pay a little bit more to get the rest of them in heaven. Well, now his head is in heaven, but you got to pay the rest of it to get those whole body in heaven. Until the point where the man just goes, if his head's in there, his arm's in there, his foot's in there, the rest of them is sure to follow one way or another. After paying thousands of dollars into the Catholic Church. It's this predatory practice that offers no surety, it offers no promises, but it just feeds upon people. You can see this with the cults that pop up all over the world. 
It's just preying upon you. It's isolating you. It's taking what we have of you and forcing other people to follow the same way. You can see it with the Jehovah's Witness that no one is promised to go to heaven, only the 144,000, and you don't know who they will be, or we do know who they will be, depending on which group of Jehovah's Witness you're talking about. But, well, you can be part of the 144,000, and you might go to heaven, or you might not be 144,000, but you should come and worship us, and worship with us, and be a part of our church, just in case. There's none of this surety that we find in God's Word that you are his child, that you walk with him, that you've escaped the sins of the world. It's these groups of people that are preying upon people to take what we can from you, and we've watered down the scriptures until it's nothing recognizable, and it's nothing that helps our soul. We can see this with the prosperity gospel is kind of the new way that that's been coined over the last couple of years of, well, if you just give to the church, if you just give to some preacher, if you just give to some group and you pray hard enough, then God will bless you stronger in the future. And it's just the same old attitude. It's the same old philosophy. It's the same old traditions where give us everything that you have and maybe God will give you more in the future. It's vain and it's empty worship. It gives you nothing. It promises nothing. Because the reality is, men's philosophies, their teachings, their doctrines are empty. Beware lest anyone cheat you. Through the philosophies and empty deceit. According to men and not according to Christ. Because really, that's what these ideas are. They're philosophies that men have come up with. They're ideas that men have come up with to be more holy, to be more servicing to him, and they give you nothing in return. It's the idea that we see that Solomon saw, not just with religion, but with philosophies in the world. That he says, I've tried everything, I've done everything, I've experienced everything, I'm one of the richest and wealthiest men to ever live, I have experienced everything that is under the sun. He is philosophized. But every answer there is for why we're here, what's our purpose, where do we find joy, and the conclusion of the whole matter has been heard. Fear God and keep his commands. It was that simple all along, and he had to spend a long time indulging himself and suffering the consequences of that to come to that simple conclusion. We see this in the world today, too. When people make their whole identity and their whole personality beyond or behind some political party, or they put it behind some movement like atheism or humanism that marvels at human accomplishments and art, and things that humans have accomplished, and that defines us as moral or worthy or not. Or when people put their entire identity behind science or behind evolution and worshiping the achievements of science, and I like science, and I'm a science nerd, and I like studying those things, but when that becomes our morality, when that becomes everything, we're, we're going to fall into a problem here real quick. If we're going to really fall into the idea that we're all just primates and animals, with barely anything better, the whole world's going to turn into chaos. Nothing good comes out of it. If we only worship the idea of humanism, and it's only if you're contributing to society and you're valuable, and if you're not contributing, then you're worthless, then what does that do to most of society? Who defines what's useful and what's not? Who decides what's good and what's not? I like art, I like reading, I like movies, I like science, I like TV. But when these things become our gods, or our standards, we're letting people cheat us. We're cheating ourselves. What value is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? We're like Esau that we studied last week. Gave everything up for what? for some temporary pleasures and philosophies here on this earth that offer nothing. Only in Christ will we find all knowledge and all riches. Back up to verse 2 of Colossians 2, that their hearts may be encouraged, knit together in love, attaining to all riches the full assurance of understanding. 
to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and of knowledge. That's where it ultimately lies. The achievements of man can be great. They can be interesting to study. They can benefit our lives in many ways. We're using some of those benefits this morning with the electricity and with the heating and with the cooling that we have in this building. There's nothing wrong with that. But let it not fool us to substitute what God has given us. Nothing compares. No technological advancement, no art, no man, no philosophy will ever surpass what God has done. From Genesis 1 and verse 1, where he spoke and it came into existence. Or when it came to him sending his son to this earth. Where Christ Jesus willingly came to this earth, who died on the cross for our sins. Nothing compares to the riches that are found in the kingdom. No authority, no idea of man is ever going to surpass anything that God has written and come up with. Every single time it has been tried, and man thinks they have found a better way than God. Time and attempt proves it to be a failure when compared to what God has to offer. In Colossians 2 and verse 9, For in him, that is Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. There's a problem, whether it be philosophies or science or religions that men have started, have come up with, have put forth, when that supersedes or attempts to supersede God, when it tries to take over and discredit what God and his God, God's word says, it ultimately fails. It cheats us and it takes us away from what is ultimately important. It is only in Christ that we are complete. Verse 10 continues, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and all power. But it's not just that that we have to watch out for, not just that that is a danger to how we walk and to those that are established, but also the old law. Even the word of God can be a stumbling block to those who are established. And you can see this all throughout the New Testament. We won't read Acts chapter 15, really the whole chapter talks about this. But the problem in Acts chapter 15 is after the covenant is here, after the kingdom has been established, after Peter and the apostles have delivered the word throughout all of Judea and the area, a new doctrine, or really in many ways an old doctrine, has started to rear its head. Where certain groups of Jewish Christians are trying to cling to parts of the Old Testament. And one of the biggest movements that is found in the Old Testament, and still around today, was this idea of circumcision. They were clinging to this idea that in order to be this set-apart people, in order to truly become a Christian, you don't just need to be baptized like what Jesus said. You also need to be circumcised because that's what Moses said in the Old Testament. Well, Paul directly addresses some of those concerns beginning in verse 11 of Colossians 2. In him, that is Christ, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through the faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. Paul gets into this doctrine and really this idea that has defined or set apart, in the Jewish community's eyes, what makes them special. And in reality, it's misinterpreting the things that were told to Abraham all the way back in Genesis. Yes, there was a physical symbolism. There was a shadow of things to come in which God told Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, circumcise yourselves and circumcise your son in which God told Moses through the old law for all of Israelites, for their children, their, their sons, to be circumcised. But this isn't what set them apart. In reality, the problem was, for many of them, they thought it meant that separated them 
It made us different from the rest of the world. But then in their everyday lives, for much of their history, they lived in sin, just like the rest of the world. They committed sins of murder, of fornication, of thievery, of idolatry, of every other sin that every other man commits. That circumcision wasn't the circumcision that God was looking for. What Christ has to offer now, Paul is saying, is a lot better than the circumcision that was there in the old law. We're not just cutting off a part of our skin. We're cutting out the sin in our lives. The old man has been put to death. We have been forgiven of all our trespasses. This is something that's more noticeable and tangible for those that walk in Christ, who do not live, who do not speak, and who do not act like the rest of the world. They're walking in darkness and we're walking in the light. That's the difference that sets us apart. That's the circumcision of Christ that Paul is talking about. And that old law, it's been done away with. We don't follow it anymore. It's useful. It can be things that we can learn from, as we even did this morning when looking some at David. There are certainly lessons that we can take away from it, but it is not binding on us anymore. That has been done away with. Verse 14 continues, Jesus having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. Paul is saying he has not just done away with it, he has made a spectacle of doing away with it. He has proven that the old law was a standard by which we could not keep and we could not follow and be saved. It was not enough for us to be fully forgiven. It was not enough for us to draw near to God. It was not enough to save our souls. It was a shadow of better things to come. Therefore, we cannot use it we cannot be condemned by it. We're not following it anymore. Verse 16 continues. Therefore let no one judge you in food or drink, or regarding a festival, or a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The problem is, it's not just a first century problem, it's a 21st century problem. Many want us to go back to Bach. Many want us to go back to the old law that doesn't save us, that doesn't help us, that can't do what the new law in the New Testament gives us. Turn back a couple of pages. I like how Paul puts this in Galatians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Galatians 5 and verse 1 reads, Stand that fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. The problem that was then is the same problem that's around today. There are people today that still try and force the Sabbath. It's part of the old law. It's gone. It's done away with. And it's not just among Jewish people. It's not just among the Seventh-day Adventists. I've grown up hearing this in the church by faithful brethren that look back at the Old Testament, that misunderstand that the old law has been done away with, and they go, well, shouldn't we still have some kind of Sabbath? Or maybe they try to bind that, well, the Sunday is our new Sabbath, therefore we can't do anything, we can't go anywhere, we have to have it as a day of rest. It's not found anywhere in the New Testament. You're trying to combine the new law and the old law and trying to mix the two there, and it doesn't work like that. Beware lest you be cheated, lest you try and mix things that don't mix. You can see this with people that try to follow some of the food regulations that are there in the Old Testament and try to bind it today. It was something that was set apart, but it's been done away with. You want more surety of that? Go read Acts chapter 10, where Paul tells Peter, what I have deemed clean, you don't call unclean. Those regulations of what's clean and what's unclean, the food that we can and cannot eat, 
has been done away with. We don't follow it. The idea of musical instruments is a stumbling block for many people. Well, they used them in the Old Testament. Why can't we use them in the New? God has not spoken of them. God has not said anything about them. He said to sing, and that's it. So that's where we stop. We follow by what God has said and not by what God has not said. People have had this as a stumbling block when they try to worship Israel, the nation, as a country. It's affected our foreign powers. And well, it belongs to the Jews when that's been done away with. People use this as a stumbling block when they talk about the feasts and worship periods. And you can see this in the Catholic Church and in other denominations that try to still keep parts of those feasts and those old laws and those old celebrations and mix it in with the New Testament. We have no authority for that. Paul specifically calls out those feasts and those things have been done away with. We don't follow that anymore. By trying to keep the old law and combine it with the new, or by trying to go back and follow the old law, the reality is we are then severed from Christ. Galatians 5, beginning in verse 2, reads this way. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you have become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is a debtor to keep the old law. You have become estranged, or I like the way the ESV puts this, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen from grace. If we keep any part of it, we have to keep the whole thing. And if we keep the full old law, we don't have the benefits of Christ. We don't have salvation. We don't have the forgiveness of sins. We're cut off from that relationship with God. He is not with us, and we are not with him. When we try to keep the old law, or when we try to keep parts of the old law, whether it be circumcision or any of the other things that we've mentioned, you don't want that relationship with God. You want a cold, hard, calculating set of rules that you can follow, and ultimately, like many of the Jews did, that you can try to find loopholes and exploit. You don't want a relationship with God. You don't want to go to heaven. You want to follow something that has been dead for 2,000 years now. And in doing so, we're severed from Christ when we follow after our own ideas and not after what God has said, we lose out on salvation. But not just that, we can stumble and we can lose our establishment by worshiping others. Colossians 2 and verse 18 specifically calls out worshiping angels, but I think this also can apply to other things as well. Colossians 2 beginning in verse 18 reads this way. Let no one cheat you of your reward taking delight in false humility or asceticism and in worship of angels, intruding in those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up in the flesh of his mind. Some of them at that time were doing like some do today and they were worshiping angels. And this was a sin first and foremost because angels are not God. They were not to be worshiped. And you can see multiple times in both the Old and the New Testament where men and women tried to worship angels, they were condemned and told, don't worship us. We're just like you. We're servants of God, but we are not to be worshipped. Revelation 22 is a great example of this, where John has been given visions and an angel comes to him. I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers, the prophets, and with those who keep the words of this book. Worship God. Immediately condemned, immediately stops this. Not me. Don't worship me. That's not what you're supposed to worship. You're supposed to worship God. Some worshiped angels, it seems, because they felt that they were unworthy. They felt like they were not worthy to draw near to God and him draw near to you. In reality, that's what Paul, I think, in part is talking about there in verse 18. Let no one cheat you of your reward. 
And this was something historically that many religions, including the Jews, had done for a very long time. You can see it in the ways in which the Jews almost kind of over-deified God. They almost sometimes placed him on a higher pedestal than he placed himself. You can see it even in the way in which they wrote and which they spoke. When you go back and you read the Old Testament where they write out Yahweh, they don't write it out the full way in which it was spelled, Y-A-H-E-W. They abbreviate it, Y-H-W-H, all capitals. And the reason they did that was because it's too much for us to write out God's full name. It's considered dishonorable. That did not come from God. God did not say that. That was not something that God told them to do. They put God on too high of a pedestal. And they wouldn't use his name. They used other names for Lord. And you can see it in the New Testament, where I'm unworthy to worship God, I'm unworthy to serve God, so instead of worshiping God, I'm going to worship his angels. And it really gets down to the problems that we find in passages like Hebrews chapter 4 where people were afraid to draw near to God. We could see this at Mount Sinai, where the people didn't want to approach the mountain. They didn't want to talk to God. Moses, you go talk to God for us. It's a problem that persisted both through the Old and New Testament, where people grew too afraid instead of having the confidence that the Hebrew writer tells us to have. Hebrews 4, beginning in verse 14, reads this way. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens... Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy, that we may find grace, and help in time of need. Some, I believe, worshipped angels because they were afraid. They listened to the teachings that might have come from the Jews, probably came from some of the secular ideas too that we can see in some of the religions that were there at that time that we can't draw near to God, we can't approach God, He's too great, He's too powerful, He's too majestic, He won't listen to me, He doesn't care what's going on in my life, therefore I have to use some intermediary. We have an intermediary, it's Christ. And he tells us, draw near to him. Boldly approach the throne of grace. Do not be afraid to pray to God, to ask of God to help, to come to him. Boldly approach the throne. Some perhaps worshipped angels because they were puffed up. They were prideful. Colossians 2, beginning there in verse 18 yet again. Let no one cheat you through a reward, taking delight in asceticism and worship of angels, intruding on those things which he has not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Some, whether they literally saw angels or whether they said they saw angels, it did not matter. They were people then, just like there are people today, they talk about having seen an angel, having seen a vision, having spoken to some angel, and I always go to Galatians 1 and verse 8 for that answer. Even if an angel did come and speak to you, which Zechariah tells us is not possible, but even if an angel does come and speak to you today, there's a really easy answer. Galatians 1 and verse 8, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, gospel contrary to the one that we preach to you, let him be accursed. Real simple answer from Paul. Even if that were to happen, and you fully believe that it happened, it means nothing. You've been delivered the entire word of God. That's what we follow. That's what we listen to. If they say the same thing, then they give you no information. If they give you new information that is contrary to what God has already said, we've already been told the gospel is complete. And we can see that with some of the religions that have come about to this day. That came about because an angel spoke to some individual, some preacher, some person who started some new religion or some movement. And we have the answer already in Scripture. 
there is going to be no new doctrine. There is not going to be some new religion. God is not going to be a respecter of persons and send some new information thousands or hundreds of years later that are contrary to what the apostles taught. It will never happen. It cannot happen. So don't worship and don't follow those people because really their problem is vanity. Their problem is they want to be puffed up. Their problem is they want people to look at them and listen to them and not God's Word. But more than just angels, I think we can see this spread out even further to some just wanted to worship people. We could see this in the New Testament. It's not a 21st century thing where men try to worship the apostles. We can see, the way, see it all the way back in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius. When Peter is sent to Cornelius' house to go and teach him the gospel by which he may be saved, what's Cornelius' first reaction when Peter walks in the door? As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, he fell down at his feet, and he worshipped him, that being Peter. But Peter, verse 26, lifted him up saying, Stand up! I myself am also a man. Don't worship me. I'm not God. I'm not worthy to be worshipped. In many ways, he's repeating what the angel told John in Revelation 22. Worship God. I'm just a fellow servant. I've been sent to you to give you the information by which you may be, by which you may be saved, but I'm not here to be worshipped. But it's interesting Peter himself fell prey to that very same temptation in Matthew 17. When then they're on the mountain, and he's following what many of the Jews already do. They didn't just hold Moses, many of them, in high regard. They worshipped Moses. They didn't just hold Elijah in high regard. Many of them practically worshipped Elijah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And when they're standing there on the mountain, and Moses and Elijah appear next to Jesus Christ, Peter and the apostles that are with him say to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents or three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. The intention is clear. Let us make three altars that we may worship all three of you. In verse 5, while Peter was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. A voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. It's a problem that people have run into for generations. And they still do it today. The Catholics worship and deify Peter and Mary and other saints who aren't even found in Scripture, but they were preachers and teachers throughout their history that they hold up in high regard. And they literally worship them in an idolatrous way. Many preachers have had this same treatment, both in and out of the church. Some of them practically are asking for it, like many televangelists. They practically want to have their cult following them and worshiping them and hanging on their every word. Some church founders, quote-unquote, have been deified and held up like Martin Luther. Even when he famously said, do not worship me, what happened after he died? A church was started in his name, he was worshipped, and he's still being worshipped today. Some, like Joseph Smith, wanted to be worshipped, claimed that an angel came and spoke to him. It's that vanity that we're talking about here in Colossians 2 that Paul's warning about. And he starts the Mormons, and he gets people to worship him, and he gets people to follow him. But this problem applies to more than just religious things. Many people worship artists and philosophers and inventors and politicians. And all of those fields are sometimes surrounded by people, like Paul warned about, that are very vain. They're very puffed up. They want to be celebrated. They want to be remembered. It's amazing. I've got, I've got my favorite artists. I've got my favorite authors. I've got my favorite movie directors and everything. And something that frequently I heard said by some of my favorite authors and different ones, 
is the reason why I write or the reason why I make music or the reason why I perform these arts is I want to be remembered for all of eternity. I want something to outlast me after I'm gone. They want something to be held up and to be worshipped about them. And that's the way in which they live their life. It's the way in which they want people to follow them. It's one thing to admire someone's trait, to celebrate their achievements, to like something that they have written or said or made. But there is a danger when we blur that line and cross over from admiration into worship. And it's a line that a lot more easily sometimes than we pay attention to gets very easily crossed for men and women throughout history. And the reality is we cross that line, we fall short and cling to men or angels or doctrines or whatever that might be. And we don't cling to Christ. There is a danger by not holding fast to the head from which the body nourished and knits together by joints and ligaments grows and increases. This is from God. And finally, while it was mentioned before angels, I also briefly for a few moments want to talk about, what well, I like the ESV version translates it, asceticism. Because it's a little bit more than false humility. It's a little bit more than self-control. It's a little bit more than just stricter doctrines. All your translations may have different words for this. Asceticism kind of encapsulates all of that. It's really this attitude of, first and foremost, binding extra commands that God has not bound. In order that we might be more holy than what God has called for. You can see this in Colossians 2, beginning in verse 21. Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, which all concern things which perish with the using, according to the commandments and doctrines of men. Paul is asking, if you died with Christ, if you put off the old world, if you're not living in the world anymore, why are we then binding, like some religions do, fasting and starving yourself? Not in the religious way, and we'll talk about that briefly here in a moment, but fasting and literally starving yourself as a form of worship. Where do we find that in the New Testament? Or where do we find these forms of abstinence and abstaining from eating or different things as a punishment because I've sinned? Do we find that anywhere in the New Testament? Or do we find anywhere in the New Testament that we literally beat ourselves or have someone else beat us so that we could be more holy and we can punish ourselves? The reality is what Paul is saying here is these things are ignoring how to combat sin and temptation. If it's just physically abusing the body, that's not what God calls us to do. These movements, although they may appear spiritual, these things indeed have an appearance of wisdom in self-imposed religion, asceticism or false humility, and neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of flesh. They have no value spiritually to our soul. It doesn't stop temptation. It doesn't give us a reason not to do what we do or to not fall prey. We combat these things by Romans 12 and verse 12, what Paul says there. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by a renewal of your mind, that my testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. It's adopting that mindset of what does God want, what does God call holy, what does God call good, through study and through understanding why God calls these things good and why God calls these things evil. And that be the reason why we do or do not do what God calls us to do in walking and serving him. The problem with asceticism and these kinds of lines of thinking is it just sets our mind on the flesh. 
Romans 8 and verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. If you're just focused on beating yourself and starving yourself and imposing all these extra restrictions on yourself that God does not say, or even if you're trying to just focus on what God has forbidden, and that's your entire focus even of Christianity, you're setting your mind on the wrong thing. You're not setting your mind on the goal of getting to heaven, of pleasing God, of honoring Him. You're focused on what you cannot do physically here in this earth. It sets your mind on the flesh and not of things of the Spirit. Another problem is asceticism and these ideas teach that we just can't control ourselves. Galatians 5 and verse 22, verse 23, I think it's interesting that the final fruit of the Spirit that Paul mentions there after love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, is self-control. Once you adopt these mindsets and these attitudes of Christ, self-control is kind of the thing that ties it all together. That you take the things of God, you put them into your heart, you put them into practice, and you make the conscious decision, am I going to sin or am I going to be righteous? Asceticism teaches these same kind of ideas that we hear today. Boys will be boys. In short, they can't control themselves. Let teenagers sow their wild oats. In other words, they can't control themselves. Or people that have gone into temptation, whether it be adultery, whether it be drugs, whether it be alcoholism, whatever it may be. Oh, I just couldn't control myself. I just didn't realize what I was doing. It all just kind of happened before I realized what was going on. All that ties back to this idea of asceticism. This belief that my actions, my life, my choices are really beyond my control. This is not the attitudes of the established, of those that are faithful, of those that understand what God calls righteous. There is a place for fasting, 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 5. For a time, do not deprive one another, but for a time, by agreement, depart, fast, give in prayer, that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Or there is a time, Matthew 6 and verse 17, when you fast, but then you anoint your head, you wash yourselves, you clean yourselves up, and you go out. You don't mar your face to show the world, look at how holy I am, look at how I'm fasting. I don't make a public spectacle of it like the Dalai Lama. That's not righteousness. It appears righteous. It appears religious. But it's not what God has asked for. That's asceticism. That's not godliness. No, what we're called to do is to take our focus off of the flesh and instead put it on Christ. These things all indeed have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion, false humility, humility or asceticism, neglect of the body, but are of no value against the indulgence of the flesh. So our call to you this morning, to me and to you, is to beware, lest anyone cheat us. To beware, lest anyone deceive us. But to take the word of God. Verse 6, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, and walk in him, rooted and grounded in love, that if you have been established, you have obeyed the gospel. You have done what God tells you to do. Do not lose that foundation. And if you are in danger of that this morning, there's sin that is in your life. If you've taken your focus off of Christ and put it on the flesh, then we can help you with that this morning. Let it be known. Talk to us privately. Come forward and confess those things if it has brought sin upon the church and upon Christ's name. Let us help you. Let us pray for you and let us assist you. If you are here this morning and you are not established, we haven't talked a whole lot about that this morning. But the water is ready. You can be helped. You can be blessed. You can be enriched. You can follow your Lord Jesus Christ starting today. If you'll repent of your sins, you too will take your mind off the things of the flesh and focus on things of the Spirit.
then you too can be rooted and grounded in love. You can be blessed and you can look forward to that home in eternity with God. The things that men have offered of this earth have no value. Not spiritually, not for the eternal destination of your soul. The things that we have studied and looked at this morning have not been my ideas and my thoughts. It's been directly from God's inspired word. And if you have further questions about that, ask that and let us help you out with that study. Whatever we can do to assist you this morning, if there's any way that we can help, please let it be known as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.